Welcome to See You on the Other Side, where the world of the mysterious collides with the world of entertainment. A discussion of art, music, movies, spirituality, the weird, and self-discovery. And now, your hosts, musicians and entertainers who have their own weakness for the weird, Mike and Wendy from the band Sunspot. Oh man, I am so excited to be back together with Wendy and Allison Jorlin from Milwaukee Ghost today because it's been a long time since we've all been we had a podcast where everybody's together yeah so in one conversation. you know what that means Mike somebody must that? have died once again <laughs> that's true oh, no we do always get together for the memorial podcast I know that's it's like sad we've had so many necrologues lately oh I've never heard of that before necrologue yeah you think wow. more like a, a, w- a wake or maybe a tribute or in memoriam, but you can use the term necrologue. Yeah, like we're that's, robots. That's the vocabulary they, word of the day. That's what yes. they use in uh, Fordian times. So ne- they have necrologues. I see. So this is our this is our necrologue today. We'll, we'll talk more about them in just a minute. Of uh, the great astronaut Dr. Edgar Mitchell, and he was a, an excellent friend to the people who like weird stuff like us. So we're a uh, tribute today to Dr. Edgar Mitchell. We're going to talk about him. But first, let's talk about what, what's on everybody's mind, the fact that it's Valentine's Day, yes. 2016, as predicted by Ghostbusters 2 as the end of the world. <laughs> well, we're, we're recording this on Valentine's Day, so if we don't right. make it, then the, yeah. the, it'll never come out. Oh, I guess all this wasted time <laughs> doing research on Dr. Mitchell. Um, no, and that was always my favorite part of the movie was the beginning. Uh, Dr. Vankman had his own paranormal show. That's right. In New York City. That's an and inspiration for what we're trying to do here. Yes, I agree. Right, totally. Well, nobody likes to remember Ghostbusters 2 because they think, I mean, it, yes, it is the lesser Ghostbusters, <laughs> but I still think of it fondly. Yeah, because it's still Ghostbusters. Yeah, and it's still pretty funny. I liked it. And the opening part's great, too, because they have, they have two people that say it's going to be the end of the world. And one guy says it's going to be New Year's Eve 1989 or whatever, the New Year's Eve coming up. Th- that guy's actually right. And that's the end of the world they avert uh-huh. in the movie. And so, you f- like, that guy predicts the end of the world. So he wasn't right, correct. though, because it didn't oh. end. That's true, because the Ghostbusters stopped. Right. It. Right. But still, I didn't realize that was in there. That's, that's yeah. great. I got to watch it again. Yeah, so uh, he it's does awesome. it, and then the, the second person predicts that the end of the world's going to come in Valentine's Day 2016. So we have a few hours left, um, so enjoy it, everybody, just in case she's right from the movie. I doubt, <laughs> I doubt that the script writers, are that, like Dan Aykroyd right. and Ivan Reitman, are like, I think well, this we're totally going to call it. But if you're listening to this, then it means it's wrong. Yes. Because we're releasing it on Monday, the day after the end of the world. Yes, and that also means that you should listen to our podcast about missed apocalypses, the ends of the world that never oh, yeah, happened. That's right. Uh, that we did. We'll put a link to that in the show notes. And the show so, notes are found where? At othersidepodcast.com slash 79. Episode 79. Here we go. All right. So it's Valentine's Day. And if you guys want to share love for us and be Aww. a See You on the Other Side podcast, Valentine then leave a five-star review on our iTunes. It's real easy. All you have to do is go into iTunes and say, I love you. Valentine's Day 2016. (laughs) See you on the other side podcast. Five stars. I I love you. It makes us feel so special. And, you know, I have an example of one because Mm. we recently got a new five-star review. Well, let's listen to our latest five-star review show. And actually, the, the subject is just love, period. Oh, that's perfect. And it's the review is left by Squatchy Poo. Oh, and my it, favorite. It, it simply says, excellent personalities, production, and guests. So, I, see? And, and it, it love. Thank you, Squatchy so, Poo. We love you. Th- yes, we certainly love Squatchy Poo. <laughs> and we appreciate those five stars you gave us because yes, that makes our Valentine, that warms our hearts on Valentine's Day. Yes. My, my co- <laughs> it, it brings life to my cold, dead heart. Gosh. Well, it's like a, a big Squatch hug. And it I is. mean, you, you'd imagine that a would big, be pretty smelly. A big, fuzzy, warm hug. It, it would be yeah. pretty smelly, but also, you know, you would feel, you would feel that earnestness of the emotion. That's Speaking it. of big Sasquatch hugs, have you guys seen The Revenant yet? No. No, is there a Sasquatch hug in that? Squatch hug? 
No, Squ- but there's a <laughs> hashtag Squatch Hog. <laughs> hashtag Squatch Hog. There is a there's a bear scene in there, which is pretty much how I think would be to hug a Sasquatch. Oh, so, uh, and, you make it uh, sound so fun. Well, <laughs> it's fun until they crush your face. <laughs> it's fun until you see what happens. Okay. Anyway, it's I'll, I'll it's, watch a, it's a great movie. There's no paranormal stuff in them. Oh, that's not true. Oh, there's something uh-huh. paranormal. Yeah, there's a ton of there's a lot of visions in oh. the movie. Ooh. So, um, maybe I, but maybe I have to consider that visions and dreams. So I think I, I, I hardly recommend it. And you'll also get to see what, what hugging a Sasquatch would be like. You'll have to let me know about the, the level of the violence though. I mean, real gritty or you'll have to see Deadpool and like, com- and like compare the violence. I doubt it's, there's no, there's no funny violence. In <laughs> no funny the violence. Revenant. It's no. like, ha ha ha, that head just blew up. <laughs> oh <laughs> yeah. There's no laugh. So giddy. The opening of the Revenant is kind of like Saving Private Ryan. Oh, oh no! I didn't know okay. that. Okay, can't do it. Can't do yeah. it. Yeah, not excited about that. Yeah, so I, I, I'd, I'd watch that one maybe distracted or something like that, or be you know eating your popcorn. It's just it's it's pretty fearsome. Anyway, right. good movie. If really you close well. your eyes, do you hear still hear squirting like the Foley <laughs> artist really, <laughs> really did her work? Or yeah. I, so you got to plug your ears too, and yes. and chew, and close your eyes. Yes. Just and basically then, go into a sensory deprivation chamber <laughs> for the first 15 minutes. Moving. This is Gensfeld. Gensfeld for the first 15 minutes. Yeah. Bring, but, uh, bring your ping pong balls. <laughs> Put them over your eyes because <laughs> you're going to see some stuff. Anyway, it's a great, great movie. A um, couple of uh, vision slash paranormal elements and not quite a Sasquatch. But if you think a Sasquatch would hug you, here's an example of, of what they might do okay. if we ran into them in the wild. All right. Okay. But it's not okay. Squatchy Poo because Squatchy Poo is at home running a five star review on iTunes for See You on the Other Side. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for bringing us back. Right now. You're like a wizard. Well, I just, you know, I the wizard want, of Segway. I didn't the want to give Squatchy Poo a bad name. No, he's great. He or um, she. So, th- right. Thanks for that. <laughs> so, okay. We just lost February 4th a very important person in the world of paranormal research. And that is the sixth man on the moon, Dr. Edgar Mitchell. And I I think one of the reasons that everybody loved Dr. Mitchell is because he's an astronaut talking about UFOs and ESP. Right. You know what I mean? Like not what you would expect. No, because it's always such a hard line with NASA and things like that. Like, yeah, no, UFOs, no way. And science. Right. They always take like the government hard line that UFOs don't exist. And here comes Dr. Mitchell, who's like, UFOs, man, they're here. I've been in space. I've seen them. Right. And uh, what about, you know, you said Dr. Edgar Mitchell. I mean, he had a lot of degrees in, you know, engineering and uh, science related fields. and to have a doctorate of, of science um, from MIT, I mean that's yes. that's pretty significant. And all the important people that he he knew and he worked with, and and don't forget, I mean he was supposed to be on Apollo thirteen, but then things got switched, and he actually you know was in the simulator while everything was going bad during Apollo thirteen, you know running simulations wow. to to help them get home. Really? So is he? The, is he like the Kevin? Kevin Bacon's the one that didn't get to the moon in the movie, right? Oh, in Apollo fifteen. I don't know. We, <laughs> we had to re we rewatch that. I, I listened to a, a two thousand and eleven uh, interview with Edgar Mitchell, probably his last interview that that I could find anyway. And um, he talked about you know running simulations while that whole problem with um, Apollo thirteen okay. was going on. You know, just to make sure that there were actual procedures that would work to get them home. Okay. That, well, that's not Kevin Bacon's character is not Edgar Mitchell. I thought for a second, I'm like, holy cow, uh, he had played by Kevin Bacon. Now that would be cool. Cause that would really well, link for the six degrees of Kevin Bacon. That would link him to the whole oh world my of gosh. science. Well, too, too bad. We couldn't link in Kevin Bacon. That's the full bacon <laughs> right there. So no, that's really interesting that he was, Obviously, he did end up going to the moon, did end up walking on the, on the lunar surface. Yeah, in 1971, right? Yeah. Okay, so he's born in 1930 in Texas. And his family moved to New Mexico, where he grew up near Roswell. 
Roswell. <laughs> yes, he didn't grow up in Roswell, but he grew up near Roswell. Which, like for us, might as well be Disney World. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> exactly. Roswell. Roswell. Woo! So when he would talk later on in his life about UFOs, he'd be like, you know, I, I know the territory there. You know, that's that's where I grew up. And, um, you know, and, and so when he, when he talked about people's descriptions and the cover up and stuff like that, he felt very connected to the town of Roswell because, you know, that he considered that that area his hometown. Gets his Bachelor of Science from the Carnegie Institute of Technology in 1952, joins the Navy like the village people. <laughs> well, he was probably the inspiration for that song. I, I would bet. <laughs> I Let's see what Edgar else Mitchell. we can connect Edgar to. <laughs> we want him for a new recruit. Yeah, and so Edgar <laughs> Mitchell uh, inspires the village people. You heard it no here. Ast- <laughs> Imagine if they had an astronaut in the village people. <laughs> that would be awesome. They should. I mean, they were totally missing that. Right. They had a cop. They had an Indian. They had a, a construction worker. That, that's had, the, the lost village person right there. They had a motorcycle leather fetishist, and all they needed was an astronaut <laughs> to, to make it complete, to, to come make round it, it out. Yeah. yeah. That would have been awesome. <laughs> Can you imagine that? Like, he's got to put up his helmet right. every time he's got to sing along. Okay. Uh, well, you know, so the, he, then it, they'd be like the Daft Punk thing. They mm-hmm. could just leave the helmet on. Exactly. <laughs> oh, right. There you go. So he's in the Navy, then earns his bachelor's in aeronautical engineering from the Navy Postgraduate School. And then gets his Doctor of Science in Aeronautics and Astronautics from MIT. So, obviously, Dr. Mitchell was no slouch. And, you know, when you think about the astronauts, like when everybody was talking, you know, if you're a kid and you said, like, oh, I think it'd be awesome to be an astronaut. Did you guys want to be astronauts? Oh, no. heck yeah. <laughs> yeah, Allison, you did. <laughs> well, I don't know. I mean, I did have a fascination with, with space as a child, but... I, did I don't too. know. Maybe it's my oldness talking. I'm like, no, I'm well, not going you... into space because I know something's going to happen with the airlock. And then my my eyeballs are going to come out my ear canal. <laughs> right, <laughs> it's going to be, be like, horrible. It's going to be like Arnold in Total Recall when he's on the surface of Mars. Yeah. And his eyes are bulging up. Ah, ah, <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm a space camp and space academy graduate. Yeah. <gasps> really? I wanted that When you went to friggin' space yeah. camp. Oh my, I, I didn't know I knew someone who went to space camp. <laughs> and I graduated. That one Thank time at space camp. <laughs> yeah. That one time at space camp, I unlocked <laughs> the air seal and killed the entire crew of Space Lab. <laughs> it happens. Yeah, it does. It did. <laughs> it really did? Well, oh Wendy my didn't gosh. Anybody, actually, but I think in the sim- your simulation no, didn't I go did. well. So, yeah. so it would be like, you know, you know, like what I was, I was laughing about, like my eyes coming out my my ears right but you know ah, we know each other we know each other so i mean it could conceivably happen that if we went to space we'd be well, together and then you you make my my ears uh, my ears explode with my eyeballs it was i mean we just we wouldn't put wendy in charge of that part it was okay. unclear how the hatch worked i didn't realize i was opening up both the inside and the outside at the That's same time always the case it's just a little bit unclear you can never put too much uh, water in a nuclear reactor, as they say. <laughs> so Wendy completely, completely opened the airlock to both sides. I exposed everyone to the vacuum of space, thereby <laughs> murdering the entire... Yeah. <laughs> but you know what? Shh. We don't need to talk about that's that. All right. oh, that's, that's all right. That's so great. I well, love now it. You, I, mean, I still graduated, so obviously it wasn't that big of a deal. Sure. Every, nobody... Everybody does it. Everybody <laughs> kills everyone in the crew. This is how we learn. I mean, it could be it could be the airlock. It could be like an event horizon type deal, you know? <laughs> it, these things happen. <laughs> Crazy stuff happens yeah. in space. That's why I don't want to go. Well, they didn't. Right. And I, I don't know if I wanted, I wanted to live in space. I just don't want to be an astronaut. Like an astronaut seems like, but then you got to realize all the work you got to do to become an astronaut. No, but you get to float around. Yes. Zero G does sound awesome. I'd love to visit space. And you get to do cool experiments. But the amount of work, I mean, these astronauts, they're like peak physical conditions. They're doctorates and geniuses. They're test pilots and like jocks. Right. Yes. And they have perfect vision. Right. So astronauts really are interesting because they have to be like... Renaissance well, folk. We were already discussing earlier, and we'll get back to it in a little bit, but Alton and I, in a previous discussion before Wendy got in line, we're, we're, we're talking about the Nietzschean Ubermensch. 
Oh, that's right. As, like, as we do. What? The Superman, <laughs> like the, uh, you know, the, the ideal human that was incredibly intelligent, uh, peak physical condition, blessed with all perfect attributes and stuff like that. Just a bad mamma jamma. The guy that you're going to give my number to. Right, yes. <laughs> Edgar Mitchell. Unfortunately, he's dead. Oh. Unfortunately, his number is up. <sighs> yes. And you have to break this to me on Valentine's Day, too. Jeez. Yep, sorry. The perfect guy. Well, but the thing is, these guys, I mean, that's why everybody wanted to be an astronaut. Like, so think about football athletes today. You know, you're like, oh, everybody wants to be Peyton Manning outside of the weird. Um... <laughs> okay, let's not take Peyton Manning for an example, because he's a, he's a bad example. Let's say everybody wants to be Aaron Rodgers. There's something like, weird. No, Peyton Manning. Aside just, from had, the weird, and then you cut a, off there. I used a, to because I just read about like a sex assault scandal in college that oh, was swept under the rug. No. So, so Peyton uh, Manning's not the, the Mister Nice they, Guy. It happens to, I, every time. I just thought it was the you know a naturally of long head that you were going <laughs> to refer right. to. And, you know, he's like one of the oblongs. It's a it's a <laughs> oh, bean head. No, he, no, he no. does. He's he's got this long head. It like the yeah. like the skulls from Indiana Jones and the, oh, the crystal skull. Oh, we're connecting it back to the oh, aliens. Nice. He's got alien DNA. That's what it right. is. No, anyway. He, Sorry, Peyton. <laughs> you feed him for a treat. You give him a little sugar cube. Um, <laughs> oh my no, gosh. but he does have a big head. Anyway. <laughs> He's a person. Don't, wanna... don't pick out his appearance. Come That's on. True. That's oh, true. Oh, make... I'm sorry. I, I didn't, I didn't so, really I don't want to say Peyton, <laughs> Peyton Manning. I mean. <laughs> let's he has feelings too, Manning. though. Everybody wants to be Aaron Rodgers. Let's take Aaron Rodgers, for example. There's no weird sex assault scandals with Aaron no, Rodgers. He, he seems like a nice guy. He does seem like a really nice guy. It's actually like one sports figure I can like. He does, yeah. and I love him, but I don't know much about his intelligence. I mean, other than like in the sports area. So That's well, what I mean. He seems that's to like I mean, Star like. Wars. What else do you need to know? <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, Allison, that's fair. You're right. He must. I bet, I bet he's worth a doctor of science from MIT. <laughs> But that's the thing. Like, if you admired an astronaut, you're admiring human beings at their best. Intelligent. They make sure they're in shape. You know, they're blessed with perfect vision and stuff like that. They made the movie the right stuff. You know, astronauts had that. True. And, and so when you look up to a sports star, it's not like looking up to an astronaut. Because it's like, yeah, Aaron Rodgers can throw a mean Hail Mary. But right. if you talk to him about orbits... He's like, that's that's where I booked my hotel. But let's can we omit when, 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 when we when we uh, when we're generalizing the astronauts, can we leave the diaper lady out of it? Oh yeah, I forgot about astronaut diaper lady. What? I don't okay. know about astronaut diaper lady. You guys have she, been keeping me out of the loop here. No, she got obsessed with a man and drove across. It was the in country. the news. Ah. Oh. Okay. She was just stalking somebody or something, and she she was wearing adult diapers so she didn't have to stop driving. To go to the bathroom. Oh, I see. Okay. That, <laughs> yeah, that makes sense. She had to drive, like, from Florida to California. Like, she had to drive across the country. But she still had to stop for gas. So, I mean, I why not just say, go in and use the bathroom quick? Well, that's where she emptied the diaper. Okay, good to know. Oh, oh God. I don't, I don't know the story. <laughs> okay, oh, sorry. I'm, I'm sorry. So we're, we're just, okay. I'm just saying not all astronauts are the ideal... You're but, absolutely but that's many true. of them. Many of them could even be. Astro- even astronauts have a couple of of of, uh, of diapered apples. But I mean, Edgar Mitchell. Oh, the the thing about him that I think is so significant is is not that he's just interested in um, UFOs and psychical research, but he's also interested about uplifting humanity. I mean, when he came back from the moon on the way back to the moon, he felt that he was irrecoverably. Does that a word? Changed by the experience where he um, just saw the earth from space and felt that, you know, we should all unite and work together and stop competing with each other, but, you know, instead focus on collaboration. So well, he, it's a little, a little uh, I know. <laughs> Kumbaya. Kumbaya, but come on, it's nice. Here's a little quote from him. As we were rotating, I saw the earth, the sun, the moon, and a 360 degree panorama of the heavens. The magnificence of all this, what this triggered, in the ancient Sanskrit, is called samadhi. It means that you see things with your senses the way they are, but you experience them viscerally and internally as a unity and a oneness, accompanied by ecstasy. All matter in our universe is created in star systems, and so the matter in my body, and the matter in the spacecraft, 
and the matter in my partner's bodies was the product of stars. We are stardust, and we're all one in that sense. Man. <laughs> Which takes us back to <laughs> Woodstock. We are stardust. Right, or as the Sunspot song, Stardust. Uh, you can also <laughs> link to that song as well. <laughs> Available online for the low, low bargain price of 99 American <laughs> right. cents. Yep, you can find that baby on <laughs> iTunes, and you can enjoy it right now. No, but, uh, so, I mean, Edgar Mitchell, like, he, he sees that, and he, I mean, he's got a, a samadhi moment where you feel a oneness with the universe when he was coming back from space. And samadhi, you usually you only get that when you're dead or when you're about to go. That's what they say. Mm. That's, so he had that come to Jesus moment coming down from space. And then he had the, the fortune of being able to share it because he continued living. <laughs> right. Yeah, he which, didn't die. Which, yeah. So he has that. And that seems to change the direction of his life. And I mean, going to space is going to change anybody's life because you're famous and you're obviously the most interesting person in almost every party right. you go to <laughs> right. afterwards. Because it's, it's like, like space, man. And they're like, yeah, I mean, you get yeah. the cool card. That guy's, oh, that guy's visited, that guy's visited six of the seven continents. Oh, that's incredible. Did I ever tell you about the time I played golf on the moon? <laughs> you know? Well, he was, I don't, who was the golfing one? I'm not sure who the golfing one was, but I know he spent 10, 10 hours like walking on the moon. Yeah, no, uh, I don't, I think the golf on the moon thing happened when he was up there. Oh. Yeah, I'm not. Yeah, Alan Shepard, 1971. Oh, yeah. He Apollo talk- 14. Okay, that was the one. Yeah, so he was, he was on the one. He was. Maybe he was just the caddy. <laughs> right. He was Alan <laughs> Shepard's caddy when they played golf on the moon. I was going to say, you, you're obviously the most interesting person in every party, but now like his life changed in that he wanted to do something about that experience he had. He wanted to create a unity in the world. And I, I think that's a, that's a really cool thing. He even did an ESP experiment when he was on the flight. And so that was, that's awesome. Yeah. yeah. He used the Zener deck, the Zener deck. And he just decided to do this on his own, right? It wasn't like a, you know, a sanctioned. <laughs> right. It wasn't like a NASA thing. Which is interesting. And he said that nobody really cared or thought it was weird or anything like that. When they asked him about it, like, no, they just thought it was cool. And he did it on his own time. And and so what, what was the experiment? There was like, Alan, is this, is this wavy lines? <laughs> no, <laughs> what do you think this one is? He didn't do it with Alan Shepard. <laughs> like, he's like, I can predict your handicap he, on this. No. Yeah, he's like, he's like, man, I, I carried your clubs. Now you got to do the senior deck thing which, with me. Which flavor of astronaut ice cream am I thinking of? <laughs> right. How much tang did I put in this? Okay, so, so no, but what he did was he had some like number tables, four tables of 25 random numbers using the numbers one to five. Then he randomly assigns a, a Zener symbol to each number. And, and then he would try to transmit what he was thinking to somebody on Earth. And the idea was that there was a person on Earth trying to, and they were they're trying to do ESP from the the longest distance you could possibly do, which is from space. And then, like the guy that he was doing it with was like a Chicago psychic or something, and that guy kind of spoiled it by going to the press about it and uh, things like there. that. And so it didn't before it before it, they did it. You mean or after? Like like right after they did it, or like. Or during, so he okay. he kind of brought some unpopular press to the whole idea, and it kind of made Edgar Mitchell sound like he was crazy. So, did they reveal how the experiment actually went? I wasn't able to find that. Okay, it's curious. But he did make it sound like there was some transmission. I didn't find any hard numbers, like a per certain percentage of hits. But he did say there were several hits, and it was kind of what they expected because the distance isn't supposed to matter and I things see. like that. And that's kind of what he, he said he learned was that the distance between people doesn't matter, that you can still transmit things to each other through ESP. That's cool. Non-locality, right? Isn't that what yep. they call it? Something like yeah, that? Yeah, non-locality. But what I also think is interesting is he comes back and the people at NASA didn't think it was weird. He said he talked to them about it and they thought it was kind of cool. And who was most interested in it was the father of rocket science himself. Werner von Braun. Hmm. And so, speaking of the Ubermensch, I mean, Werner von Braun, they brought him over in Operation Paperclip. He's the man that developed the V2 rocket for the Nazis. 
that they bombarded England with in the Second World War. And so, I mean, we'll have to have a whole episode on Operation Paperclip sometime cool. and all the German scientists that they brought to the United States. Yeah. But he's interested. And, and Edgar's quote was, you know, Werner was very int- intrigued by it and very supportive. He wanted me to do a survey of NASA installations to see if there was any place that would be useful and appropriate for us to do some more of this work to further these studies in a deeper way. But we both left NASA before we ever got accomplished. And Werner von Braun even did a, a fundraising dinner for his Institute of Noetic Sciences. Yeah, started by Edgar in 1972, I think. Yeah, so he comes back to Earth and starts an institute for exploring ESP business. So what are the noetic sciences? And this is actually from their website, noetic.org, N-O-E-T-I-C. Noetic, from the Greek, noesis, meaning inner wisdom, direct knowing, or subjective understanding. Sciences. Yeah, we know what sciences are. Noetic sciences is a multidisciplinary field that brings objective scientific tools and techniques together with subjective inner knowing to study the full range of human experiences. So he founds that when he gets back, not not like right after. It's mm. not like he got off the, he didn't get off the, uh, like wh- wherever they landed in the sea or yeah, whatever. They, like, you know, they come out of the ocean. <laughs> he's he's like, like, get me to the Institute. I'm so, so I'm not sure. I got to do this right now. Don't bother picking me up. But if he was affected by that experience profoundly, then it makes sense that he'd want to absolutely get going on that. So that he really got into it from there and he, and he founds this, you know, Institute of Noetic Sciences and... I mean, th- this is the direction he goes to for the rest of his life, is starting to do this research, appearing at UFO conferences. I, you know, and I think that's what makes him pretty interesting. You know, there, there is some stuff where, um, like, people did misquote him and stuff. There was a, uh, an interview in the English tabloid, The Mirror, that says... Oh, uh, they never get anything wrong. No, The Mirror is always right. <laughs> And it says that, that he said that the aliens are coming to stop us from destroying each other with nuclear weapons, kind of like the day the Earth stood still kind of thing. And so he said that they fabricated his quotes, that he said things like, White Sands was a testing ground for atomic weapons, and that's what the extraterrestrials were interested in. They wanted to know about our military capabilities. And officers from bases on the Pacific coast told me that their test missiles were frequently shot down by alien spacecraft. So that's like that's what the mirror claims he said. That's a pretty on the record. Like, yeah, <laughs> strong quote to right. <laughs> yeah, to misquote. And so whatever. he says that I've told several sources about my connections over the years with the military officers manning missile silos during the Cold War with the Soviet Union, who told me personally of UFOs hovering over their missile sites and disabling the missiles targeting the Soviet Union. So. The mirror did kind of make up some quotes about him, or at least he said they kind of did. I don't know. Maybe the government got to him. Mm-hmm. This was in 1980. He was 80 years old. And maybe he just didn't. Maybe they threatened him. I don't know. They did. There's wait, no thing. Wait, when, when was the quote? 2010. Oh, 2010. Okay. okay. He was 80. So yes. he, he was 80 in 2010. Yes, that's yes. right. So I just, it just made me laugh to think about like him saying this stuff to the mirror and then the men in black come visit him and say, you've been saying too much. (laughs) We're going to let you live because you're a national hero. Look at this pen. Well, well, we know (laughs) that there are sources, military men from the past who not so long ago had made similar claims about nuclear installations in the, the um, U S and, and missile sites in the U S that, that there have been flyovers and uh, missile shutdowns when the crafts were in the air. So, And he, he is quoted as saying, I know for sure we're not alone in the universe. Yes, now, we have been yes. able to identify for sure whether the other planets are. No, we haven't yet. But they've identified quite a number of planets now that very, very likely could be life-bearing planets. I happen to be privileged enough to be in on the fact that we have been visited on this planet and the UFO phenomenon is real although it has been covered up by our governments for quite some time. Yeah, and um, in an interview I listened to from 2011, he, he did talk about that, and that was really compelling about how, you know, he had, of course, you would, you would in his position, have top military and government contacts. And he said, you know, although he didn't have firsthand knowledge, he really felt that, you know, the people that were talking to him, you know, had 
had the um, knowledge, you know, had the credibility to put him in a situation where, you know, he couldn't doubt it anymore that we had have had direct contact with. Uh, on this interview, he said more than one species of alien race. Well, did he did he say like anything like reptilians, grays? Well, he did. He did talk a little bit about the grays as if, you know, they were a real thing. And that, okay. that we did have you know, knowledge of the grace. So the little guys with almond eyes. <laughs> okay, that's cool. And Legit. Did, did he say that any of, it, like any of his sources, didn't he say that Werner told him something? Werner von Braun mentioned, like, had seen the aliens? Well, that was in a, a 2007 uh, Coast to Coast interview. You know, I don't know exactly what he said, but it says that multiple sources, such as Werner uh, I can't even say it. Then the Van Braun. Thank you. <laughs> had felt that ET contacts were were real. Okay. Multiple well, high level sources. Uh, okay. Well, had had confirmed. And having a guy like that, but also at the same time, when you think about who would be good for disinformation, who better to spread disinformation around than an old Nazi? <laughs> Well, that's you know, true. That's true. Yeah, that's the kind of thing. Like, who can we get to lie for us? Oh, you know, Werner will do it. He'll do anything. He's he says great at yes that. to everything. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, that's how he got in this country. Yeah to everything. Yeah. He had I to say you, yes to everything. There are UFOs all over. <laughs> it's crazy. Anyway, but that's, I think that's really interesting. And, you know, I like when you talk about the Institute of Noetic Sciences, like Dean Radin is very involved with them. Yes. He's a parapsychologist that we talk a little bit about in our interview with uh, Nancy, Dr. Nancy Zangroni. Right. And, and he's one of the main, and they have like seven scientists like working. So the fact is the Institute of Noetic Sciences is, it's a pretty cool thing that they're doing this kind of research it's awesome. and it's been able to support it for over 40 years now. And, right. Because there's such a stigma against even looking into that, the role of, you know, anything that's not material. And that's what Edgar challenged that, you know, okay, you're a materialist. I understand that, you know, materialism has taken over the sciences, but what if there's something else? You know, what if the, the level of um, science is, is beyond Newtonian physics? He felt that the answer was in quantum physics, as many people do today. Sure. Um, but yeah, I mean, he, he challenged that, you know, you can't, you can't uh, make these determinations based on today's knowledge. You have to be forward thinking. And then in 1974, he wrote a book with Martin Ebon called uh, Psychic Exploration, A Challenge for Science. So, yeah, this is three years after he got back from the moon. He wrote a book about explorations into uh, controversial areas in science. Well, and he, I mean, he says, uh, I theorize that there's a spectrum of consciousness available to human beings. At the one end is material consciousness. At the other end is what we call field consciousness, where a person is at one with the universe, perceiving the universe. Just by looking at our planet on the way back, mm. I saw or felt a field consciousness state. Cool. So, uh, I mean, that's the kind of stuff they were studying at the, at, they study at the Institute of Noetic Sciences. You, I mean, <clears throat> I think that Dan Brown, you know, the author of the Da Vinci Code mm -hmm. and everything, he uses, he talks about noetic sciences in his book, The Lost Symbol. And it's kind of a, I mean, a bastardization of, of what we're talking about here. Like they, it's kind of like whenever they put parapsychology in a TV show or something, like in, in parapsychology, they're always like way ahead. Right. You know, the, the <laughs> sci and they always had these like well-funded research institutions and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Like Sci Factor, Chronicles of the Paranormal. <laughs> right. Well, and it's, it's a miracle that, you know, Edgar Mitchell could, could make that happen in, in, in some, to some degree, not to the extreme D degree of funding that you always see, you know, on TV. <laughs> but if the real scientist had that type of funding, you'd think that we'd be making a lot more advances. The the problem is that you know people don't want to put money into it. Right. Well, I think one thing about Dr. Edgar Mitchell though that that's really powerful is the fact that the credibility that he brought to it. You know, I mean, I think that's why everybody wanted to talk to him. Everybody wanted to write books with him. Everybody wanted to work with him because. I mean, not only is he an astronaut and um, one of the finest examples of humanity from the, in the 1960s, he's also open to these ideas in a way that, uh, let's say you brought out, 
uh, who's the, the biggest physicist today everybody loves? Right, Neil. Oh, uh, Neil deGrasse, deGrasse Tyson. Tyson. Yeah. yeah, yeah, and and Neil deGrasse Tyson's fun, and his cosmos was obviously excellent, but he wouldn't touch psi phenomena with a ten foot pole. Yeah, you know, interesting. What I mean? Yeah, that's He'd true. Be like, nope, nope, nope. And I mean, obviously, Allison, you were saying this before in in the pre show when we were talking about Edgar Mitchell also dealt with. Everybody's psychic punching bag, Yuri Geller. <laughs> oh, that's true. <laughs> and I mean, Yuri Geller kind of takes the level of anybody's credibility down a notch. Right. Even Edgar Mitchell, you know, when when I found out that they were both involved with the Stanford Research Institute, SRI, I think that's what that stands for. And um so, you know, that's how they, they came into contact is is through their the work at Stanford. But just even even having Uri like photobomb you or something, you immediately <laughs> immediately go down in credibility like quite a lot. You get photobombed by your yeah. Every, every celebrity in the seventies got photobombed by your gallery because he was <laughs> always he was on the everywhere. Tonight show, bending spoons. I always thought it was fun whenever he was on a show. It's like, oh yeah. man, your gallery is going to be something on. different. Yeah, and Mike, there goes your credibility. No, yeah. I'm because I said oh, I used to like Yuri Geller as a kid. He, I also, little Mike. <laughs> if, well, no, if we get if we get photobombed by Richard Dawkins, does that bring us up a level then in this right, materialist get, world? Photobombed by Richard Dawkins, like Come all of a sudden, on, it's like Richard, you're take a selfie with me. Take a selfie with me, <laughs> and then people will listen to what I have to say. Right, he bops you on the head, and you're atheist now. <laughs> I've been baptized by Richard Dawkins, the anti Yuri Geller. <laughs> No, I mean, but that's the thing. So he did participate in stuff with Yuri Geller. And that when we talk about how much credibility he brought to things, that always hurts. But the thing is, I feel that people who research psychic phenomena are not allowed to make mistakes. You yeah. Know, it's, it's just held to a different field. Like if, if you subscribe to a weird belief for a little while, you're basically seen as a madman. Yeah, it's a double standard. Yeah. It is. So they can't just say like, you know, I was wrong. I believed in this stuff. It just ruins your credibility for a long time. And I, I think that's not necessarily fair as long as they, as long as people acknowledge, well, yeah, you know, I thought that was for real for a little bit. And then I had to change my mind because it turned out to be crazy. Well, uh, but I people think- have to realize that stigma, this whole, you know, idea that, that people have that, oh, you know, oh, no, we don't, we don't deal with that. You know, that's the problem Mm -hmm. is is that we can't be open minded enough to just look at things as they are. But instead, you know, we're putting these judgments on them. That's not scientific to put judgments on things ahead of time. So if you're talking about being scientific, you should not subscribe to any type of stigma. You should not, you know, think that's a real thing. The idea is that you can prove something. And, you know, the, well, the thing is, when you like, take Isaac Newton, like nobody dismisses Isaac Newton because half of the stuff he wrote about was about alchemy. Oh, I mean, that's he, right. He wrote about f- plenty of stuff about physics, but he also was trying to turn lead into gold, you know, and that was also a big thing that he researched for a part of his life. And he doesn't have to be right to be alchemy, to be right about gravity. Yeah. He doesn't have to be right, right. about when, when he predicted the world to end to be correct about uh, <laughs> physics, but the area underneath a curve, like he got that one. That's a big one. You know, pretty good. Pretty good. We don't dismiss Isaac Newton. Uh, we don't dismiss calculus <laughs> because uh, he was uh, uber religious and even, you know, tried to predict the end of the world from like numbers in the Bible. Right. Um, why should we just, dis- we can't dismiss Edgar Mitchell just because he had a couple of drinks with Eric Geller. And we can't dismiss Eric Geller just because it's proven that he's pretty much a fraud with the spoon bending. <laughs> like, he might have done something, you know, and that's the problem. I mean, mm-hmm. I guess science a lot of it about repeatability. And if you have to cheat to achieve rep- repeatability, well, then that's the, that's the whole issue. Well, isn't that like the Philip K. Dick kind of um, philosophy of, of uh, ESP, that there's some people who have, who have real ESP, but... You know, they the only way that they can make a headway in the society is through show business. Mm-hmm. So they pursue that, which makes their credibility go down to nil. And but they get money. And then, yeah, but they get money to live. So you yeah. know, this whole the, there's something compelling in that this this idea that there could be real uh, psychics out there. There could be 
people with powers that, you know, we don't quite understand right now. But the only place where they're going to get any uh, attention and any money to survive is um, entertainment. Right, like being on the Sci-Fi Channel, crossing over with Jonathan Edwards. Yeah, or I'm not saying it's, he's psychic. Yeah, the the only the only way to to live is to sell out in in this society right now. That that's a, an argument. And we talked about this before with the the UFO researchers when that whole the thing in Mexico. Yeah, the slides. Yeah, exactly. Mm-hmm. Where you know, okay, it ended up being kind of a a big disappointment or whatever, but a huge disappointment. But the hype got a lot of attention, and you know. Maybe got them some money to continue the research and continue right. doing the stuff. So. You only got to be right once. <laughs> right. And then the rest, I mean, because you're only as good as your last hit. And if your last hit is something huge, like UFO disclosure, well, then, then nobody's going to care that you used to hang out with Yuri Geller. You know, <laughs> you make me think about this particular quote from Edgar Mitchell. The desire to live life to its fullest, to acquire more knowledge, to abandon the economic treadmill are all typical reactions to these experiences in altered states of consciousness. The previous fear of death is typically quelled. If the individual generally remains thereafter in the existential state of awareness, the deep internal feeling of eternity is quite profound and unshakable. So, I think what Edgar's trying to tell us is, uh, quit your job, and then just drop out, man, and get, man. become one with the universe. Uh, because it's <laughs> way better to be one with the universe than to be in the rat race. And I have to agree with him on that one. Yeah. That it's much better to live a, a regular life than, than worry about if you've got a 4K TV or not. <laughs> and you guys don't have 4K TVs, right? No. <laughs> no. Okay, just making sure I don't got to get one. <laughs> <laughs> we don't know what we're but missing I'm, yet, so it's, we're, right. we're good for now. I mean, but that's the kind of thing, like, you know... I really like how he just kind of lays it out. Now, he saw this. He had, his, he had his moment. And he's trying to get the rest of us to have those moments. With his Institute of Nomadic Sciences, his book, The Way of the Explorer. I mean, all that kind of thing. And, you know, if we are one with each other and one with the universe, well, that means we got to be one with the aliens too, right? Right. So, so true. Well, so when he says that the aliens aren't necessarily bad and maybe trying to help us, and he, he's not afraid that they're going to come and invade the planet, like Stephen Hawking is. Stephen, I mean, no, Stephen Hawking right. says he's like, I mean, uh, somebody, somebody with an advanced, Stephen Hawking says, you know. Oh. Like, right? We love Stephen Hawking. No, of course, everybody loves Stephen Hawking. Um, well, not his ex-wife, but. Oh, let's, the, oh my gosh, this is the gossip episode. Oh, come I'll on. see you on I the mean, other side. He leaves his wife for his nurse. Oh, He's gonna be... I know. That's, right. That's, what's, his nurse, what's his nurse thinking? We're, we're now in the tabloid zone. And I'm sorry. Okay. I, I, let me apologize to both Stephen Hawking and Peyton Manning. I didn't mean the big big head thing. <laughs> <laughs> right. I didn't mean it. I, I mean, she, her, I, I joke. Her official apology is, is out Yeah, yeah. I, I joke with my husband that, you know, because he has kind of a head, you know, similar to that. And so... I hope your husband has a head. <laughs> My husband has kind of a head. <laughs> kind Good. of a head. So he's not the title character oh. of a Washington Irving story. Oh <laughs> yeah, yeah, but but I always call him a bean head, and he call, calls me a pea head. So I see. You know, because so I have a guys, small oh, round you guys head, are and so he has cute. a yeah long <laughs> so, vegetable head. So Peyton, I, I'm sorry. Sorry. Okay, great. Well, <laughs> I said it with love. What I'm trying to I was just saying that Stephen. So Stephen Hawking <laughs> thinks. And I'm not, you know, I'm never going to meet Stephen Hawking, so I don't really care. I'm not on the cast of the Big Bang Theory. We get to get to meet. Uh, All right. But um, so Stephen Hawking says that, you know, in the past, when two civilizations have come into, you know, come into contact and one has much higher, much more advanced technology than the other, what's always happened is that the civilization with the less advanced technology gets oh, yeah. assumed. We saw that in the movies. Assumed. Right. And Edgar Mitchell doesn't feel like that. And that's, that's, a, that's a difference. Yeah, it is. Because you're saying is that, okay, here's the perspective of a, a serious materialist. I mean, Stephen Hawking's a great writer, and, he's super, and he seems like a fun guy. But <laughs> if he says, like, yeah, well, if aliens can come here, they're going to take us over. Versus aliens are here, and, they're, and they understand the universe a little bit better than we do. Because also, these civilizations we're talking about that have come into conflict in the past, and one destroys the other invariably, are always human. True. And maybe maybe the aliens, I hope that the aliens, are just a little bit smarter than we are. Because if they can figure out how to get past half the, you know, get through half the universe, you know, if they can if they can travel 
to Earth from a different solar system, then obviously they're not worried about resources. You know, they're not trying to get the spices to India or whatever, or <laughs> they're not trying to, they're not desperate for gold. You know, they're not looking to start a, you know, a slave race or anything like that. Right. But like Just, the Anunnaki. Right. The, if the Anunnaki are here, I, you know, if I'm completely wrong. And planet if, X is coming, Mike. <laughs> the planet X and the Anunnaki are coming. <laughs> then I guess we're screwed. Stephen Hawking is right. That's right. Wouldn't it be funny if Stephen, like Stephen Hawking proves the most prescient <laughs> when, when Planet X has proven the Anunnaki all get off and take us over and we become the slave race on our prison planet. No, the, the idea that um, they can make it all this way, the chances are of them worrying about having to set up a sugar plantation are low. You know, if they don't have to worry about resources, then why do they want to take us over? Yeah, you know, it's more even, like Star Trek. It's more like right. they, they just want to right. explore. Right, the Vulcans just want to show up and give us like a high five <laughs> or a high four. Oh, I think it would be. <laughs> so, and I, I think that would be that would be the idea. If you can get here, why are you interested in invading us? You know, when you look at all these alien invasion stories in the past, it's always because they want something. In the original one, War of the Worlds, it's because Mars is a dying planet. In V, it's because they want to eat us and they want uh, and they want our water. In Independence Day, it's the same kind of thing. Oh, wait. Have you guys seen the trailer for Independence Day 2 yet? I just yes, saw it last night. I want to see it. <laughs> yes. Come on. It totally looks sweet. It looks good. It's amazing. Welcome to Earth. Jeff Goldblum. Yeah. Still still, still like him. Yeah, everybody. I mean, I love Jeff Goldblum. Even <laughs> in this likeable. weird, even in this weird apartment net. Have you seen those commercials? Yeah. Very weird. Yeah, still, yeah, I still weird. like him. He's got an appealing thing about him. <laughs> yeah. No, he's Jeff Goldblum. He's always been from the fly. To Jurassic Park, he's always just been a little off, and you got to like right. that about the guy. The quirkiness. Yeah. So that's what I appreciate about Edgar Mitchell, is that he's like, you know what? It doesn't have to be all about invasions and stuff. They're here. Right. And, they're, and he was also one of the big voices for UFO disclosure. So that, that was something, I mean, he was saying he couldn't figure out why the government kept on hiding it. You know, mm. he said, the, he's like, I know they're here. He's like, and the government can't cover it up. But the thing is, they've been spreading so much disinformation for the past 50 years in weird stories, in, in, in the information they choose to release, or when crazy ideas get taken over in our minds. I mean, that's kind of what the, the first episode of the new X-Files deals with. And I think this is kind of where we are in Uf, the UFO lore at this present time. Yeah. That back in the 1990s, we all thought the government was really like hanging out with Aliens, like aliens were at Area 51 and they were like playing chess or something. Yeah, you know, like, in the underground base. Right. Like, oh yeah, aliens are here. Like, that's our buddy over there. You know, you ever got. I just tried to make up an alien. I was world, wondering what that, that was pretty good. <laughs> just saying like, that's our friend over there. And then we pronounce his name. But, <laughs> you know, just that idea. He says, many of these folks under high security clearances, they took oaths and they feel like they cannot talk without some form of immunity. And it takes a really brave person to come out on something like this. And he says that it's the government, but it's not NASA. He specifically says that NASA is no, not involved in the cover That's at all. That's interesting. Hmm. Yeah. So how's the government getting the information? Well, I mean, the thing is, if you were going to know about UFOs, mm -hmm. what, kind of, what kind of person would you have to, like what kind of clearance would you have to have? And it'd have to be CIA kind of things. But I mean, where would because, they be getting the information from? Oh, well, he says he knew witnesses from intelligence agencies. So that's But would the intelligence the, agencies have to have some kind of like I don't know telescopes or <laughs> things like <laughs> communication. No, right. I mean, I don't know, like space related. So Wendy, you don't buy that NASA's not involved. Well, Wendy's I, like not, NASA's in, they know about it. Werner von Braun was an alien. How could they not know? I just feel like right, because they're they're the ones with all the tools for that type of exploration. Uh, you know? I see. I see. Like, okay. So I'm thinking of a crash and then people come oh, and see the crash. And I you're see. thinking of NASA Spotting like sees something. like a UFO or like, or, or yeah, like they see like they a, get a phone call like, hey, NASA, they, it's Nicaragua. They encounter a <laughs> ship like floating around out there somewhere and they're like, hey, what's this? Yeah. Sure. So oh, no, I can you're see right. That. We're looking at it from that. different perspectives here. So how would NASA not know yeah, about it? That's what I was thinking. Okay. They got their well, eyes on I, the skies all the time. Yeah. And I think, um, I think Edgar, though said that, you know, he never saw anything 
you know, to lead him to the conclusion that they're aliens from his experience out in space. And yes. he didn't think that the other astronauts had either. I mean, that's the that's the consensus. But it, it's interesting that they're experienced in other ways. You know, that mm -hmm. you know, you're not going to see it if you just leave the atmosphere and you just go to the moon or on sure. a shuttle mission or whatever. Yeah. You know, you're 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 not going to automatically experience them. So so that that kind of uh makes you wonder if we are, you know, talking about extraterrestrials or like some people have have um insinuated, you know, that we're we're dealing with um with interdimensionals. Yes, interdimensional mm. beings just like in Indiana Jones and the Kingdom of the Crystal Skull. Oh, that's right. <laughs> that's what they are. They're interdimensional beings and not aliens. And John Hurt's character makes sure to uh say that. I was just talking about somebody with, about Indiana Jones and the Crystal Skull this week, and I had to defend it. They were like, I thought that movie was crap. And I'm like, you probably didn't like it because you weren't six years old anymore. Well, you know, you, and they probably didn't like it because of the whole um, monkey scene. You know, the monkey with scene the, was, was yeah, bogus. I yeah, the monkey scene. I, if, that one, if that had just been cut out, I think it would stand a little bit stronger. That could be left in the cutting room floor. Yeah, I agree. Get rid of that monkey scene. Oh. <laughs> But, you know, to me, I thought, I was like, oh, yeah, it's, it's, it's how sweet are we singing Indiana Jones? And everybody's like, ah, it's, it's not the same. I'm like, of oh. course it's not the same because we're adults. That's true. Yeah, it's not the same because, you know, you, you never walk through the same river twice. You know, you're different. <laughs> well, well li listen to that kind of wisdom coming out of you, Allison. <laughs> it's, it's zen. I oh. mean, we're, we're, talking about, we're, we're talking about Edgar Mitchell here, man. So I got to step it up a little That's bit true. with the whole That's spirituality true. You know, you walk to the same river twice. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you know what I'm saying, man? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Pass whatever doober you're doing. Oh, man. come on. I'm Com just teasing you. Completely, just teasing you. completely just, you know, the Samadhi experience. That's what I'm, I'm riffing on the Samadhi experience. That, that's no, what's happening the, here. No, <clears throat> but I mean, so Edgar Mitchell works on this stuff for, I mean, 45 or you know 43 45 years he's been involved in this and so it really is i mean 86 years old though i mean he had a good run no 85 oh, wasn't he 85 oh, 85 85 okay. yeah i would lo love to add another year on there sure but i mean 85 years old uh you know that i would say that's a pretty good that's a pretty good run yeah and, you know and he did all right and he he got to go to the moon he never got to go back to space, though. That's that's what's sad to me. You were saying yeah. he wanted to go back to space before he was a hundred. Yeah, his his wow. his last interview with um another podcast, um Howard Hughes Unexplained, which I listen to all the time. He interviewed him in 2011, and he talked about how he'd really like to go back to space, and that maybe he could get there, you know, before he was a hundred. <laughs> that just made me so sad, uh -huh. and especially you know listening to. All the things that, you know, he wanted to do to, you know, make the world a better place. And um, on that note, he does have a, a book, an audio book that came out in um, 2015 called Paradigm Shift, Science and the Inner Experience, Your Universe and You and Global Mind Change. And he thought that was necessary, that we, we needed to come together as a people, you know, the, the whole earth had to come together and take us to the next level. Uh, to get us, you know, back into space, get us beyond the solar system, but also, you know, it's more important than that. It's it's more than just the physical. It it's more about the mind shift um, towards, you know, seeing each other as brothers and sisters and and uh, collaborating rather than competing. You know, I think that's completely right, and I, I can tell you that after spending ten days of driving in Miami, that people need to start thinking about each other. Right. And, you know, instead of thinking about themselves all the time, um, that was the most dangerous driving I've ever experienced in my life. I was scared to death the entire time. But that that global mind shift in that so many people have a scarcity mindset that, you know, I call it the buffet mentality that I'm going to go to the buffet and I'm going to get all I can right now and, and take I, all I'm, the desserts. Yeah. Yeah, I'm gonna go up there to the Pizza Hut buffet and I'm gonna take all the dessert pizza. So you get nothing. <laughs> no, not the Zinna sticks. Right. How many times have I seen somebody oh, grab all the blueberry dessert oh, pizza, leave me with the cherry? Not cool. Right. Not cool at all. 
But that kind of mindset where you're just out for yourself and not realizing that we're all in it together and that we all have to work together in order to make the kind of changes that we need to see. I'm with Dr. Mitchell 100% on that global mind change because the more I run into people with that buffet mentality Mm -hmm. and the scarcity mindset that I got to get mine now or I'll never get it and I don't care if you get yours, the more I see that, the more I realize that we need to have an alternate way of thinking and it needs to happen as soon as possible. Here, here. Preach on. Yeah. Man. Amen. Man. <laughs> anyway, so there we go. Thank you. <laughs> Slow clap. All right. <laughs> All right. <laughs> you guys hate you. Oh, well, we love you. We love you. Thank you. Valentine's Day. I love yes. you guys too. Okay. I, I, feel, I feel the cosmic love coming over I me. I you, man. <laughs> the cosmic <laughs> love of somebody. No, but yes. I really, I really. Yes. Um, I do agree with that. think that. I would give him a, a, you know, I think he should have had a few more years. I, I just think he was, you know, such a force for good in our world. And so I'm sad well, that he didn't make it to 100 and back in the space. Me too. So thank you for joining us today, Allison, on this uh, little retrospective on Dr. Mitchell. Yes. Yeah, thank you. And uh, let's close with a little quote from him. There seems to be more to the universe than random, chaotic, purposeless movement of a collection of molecular particles. On the return trip home, gazing through 240,000 miles of space toward the stars and the planet from which I had come, I suddenly experienced the universe as intelligent, loving, and harmonic. This week's song is inspired by Dr. Edgar Mitchell and the optimism that people felt during those early days of space pioneering and exploration. Hopefully we can get that spirit back, and this song is called Shoot for the Stars. Thank you for listening to today's episode. You can find us online at othersidepodcast.com. Until next time, see you on the other side. Zing you ever got?